Hey guys and welcome to um, my um, solar eclipse forecast for the upcoming Sagittarius um, new moon solar eclipse that we've got on the 4th of December 2021. So this will be my final um, forecast uh, in terms of eclipses for 2021. It's the last eclipse of, of the year and it's quite an interesting one from a lot of different perspectives. Um, so I'm going to look at it in a fair amount of detail but if you are interested in um, more personalized forecasts I do do six month eclipse um, horoscopes for each of the 12 zodiac signs um, in video format so you can access those if you subscribe as a member to my I think it's my gold um, membership um, so just go to the astrologysphere.com um, shop and um, and you'll find more information about subscribing there um, but let's get into the forecast and see what we can look forward to between now and around May, June next year. So first off, for those who aren't really familiar with astrology and the astrology of eclipses, um, this is something that I specialize in. You can you can find out more on my website. But essentially for me, solar eclipses are turbocharged new moons. So they tend to begin six-month cycles. Um, they are kind of like seed moments or they're very good for intention setting and for... Um, kind of medium range goal setting if you like so as I say usually um, what happens is that um, whatever we, we sort of set in motion now does tend to uh, kind of manifest within a six month period and so it's it's worth bearing in mind because um, this one will take us into 2022 so in many ways you could say that this is almost like the kind of the new year um, kind of eclipse so if you want to sort of get your new year's resolutions in early I, I suggest that you you think about them and that you're kind of ready to plant those seeds um on the 4th of december when, when when this eclipse kind of comes into play so what's kind of interesting about this one in particular is that it happens at the south node the eclipses always happen at the nodes which are the head and tail of the dragon in arabic astrology this is the where the paths of the sun and the moon cross their orbits and um they always take place when, when we have a total solar eclipse like we do um, at this particular event. Um, they always take place very, very close to or on the nodes themselves. So this one takes place at the south node. And that's kind of interesting because it's really the tail of the dragon. And in many ways, it's, it's particularly if you think of it in terms of geomancy, it's the antithesis to the north node, which is about kind of beginnings and entrances, which is what new moons are usually about. So there's a kind of a double-edged energy to this, where we kind of almost like Jane is the two-headed god. We're kind of looking in two different directions at the same time. We're in this very liminal space where where um, we're kind of almost given the opportunity to rewrite the past. Um, we can, I mean, you know, if, if you listen to people that talk about kind of quantum um, physics and this idea of multiple dimensions and also being, being able to kind of go backwards and forwards in time, there is this idea of... Um, you know, if if you if you change something now in the stream of time, you also potentially can change the past as well as the future. So it's that kind of energy that we're essentially sort of looking at, where we are at a kind of a um, a tipping point where we where we're moving into a new six month cycle, but we are also in the position where we're kind of being allowed a window. A window is opening up where we can rewrite the past, where we can renew um, our kind of karmic patterns if you like we can maybe sort of rewrite them or scrub them you know in other words go into the akashic records and sort of like cancel those contracts or patterns and things that that, that are not really serving us and release baggage in order to start fresh and we see this quite strongly in the sabian symbol for um this particular eclipse which is very much focused on kind of history in 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 all senses so um this this particular eclipse happens on the side of gemini i sort of axis which we started back in I think it was 2020 um, we moved out of the kind of Cancer Capricorn axis of eclipses and into the the Sag Gemini um, set which sort of um, around about May June when we so the first two eclipses of 2020 were in the the Capricorn Cancer axis kind of as we moved into that very difficult um, Saturn Pluto conjunction and then we moved out of that into the the sad gemini axis because don't forget that the the nodes move backwards so they move in an anti-clockwise direction um so the opposite to, to the zodiac um so this really is all about um you know kind of beliefs thinking teaching travel knowledge spirituality and 
also things like self-expression. So it's, it's the way that we kind of take in information, process it, and then give meaning to it, assign meaning to it. So, um, you know, in many ways you could see this as, as being a time when you are able to kind of scrub old patterns of thinking and, um, and, and ways of perceiving all kind of attitudes, outlooks, and beliefs. And also just really examine your thinking because so often... You know, I've said this in the past um, quite a lot. You know, if you want to talk about the sort of the ego mind or the kind of monkey mind, it really is that kind of um, that sort of chattery um, kind of uh, mental faculty that never shuts off and that very seldom gives us any peace and that's always kind of questioning everything that's quite critical. It's almost, you know, Richard Rudd talks about like the cup and the sword and I would associate these with um, the the crown chakra and the third eye. So it's really learning to sort of master your third eye energy so that it works well in conjunction with, with the cup. So the cup is more receptive. It's that sort of um, that intuitive um, receptive information that we get from um, from external sources, so from you know our spirit guides, from source, from our higher self, our over soul, um, that kind of thing. Um, whereas the the third eye is more like Gemini energy in the sense of it's it's it wants to discern, it wants to dis like discriminate, it wants to separate things out, to tell one thing from another, often through contrast. Um, which can be helpful to create order, you know, it's like the left brain. But then on the but on the other hand, it can also overanalyze. It can get us in kind of loops where we just have this never-ending uh, kind of questioning of everything, and there's no faith. We don't believe in anything because, you know, everything can essentially be taken apart and sort of rearranged in um, any number of uh, forms. You know, if you think about data. Um, so I think it's really asking us to to try to. Um, Focus more on beliefs, um, you know, because we are talking about a solar eclipse in Sagittarius, and um, and really sort of come from a position of faith and um, uh, kind of wisdom as opposed to just knowledge, um, you know, which is represented by Mercury. And it's interesting because Mercury uh, rules Gemini, and Mercury is quite prominent at this eclipse. So there really is this this kind of this, this dual energy that needs to be kind of balanced. Um, in order for us to find peace and to also continue those themes that we had at the lunar eclipse, the Taurus lunar eclipse, you know, around those Jupiter transits where we had that Jupiter T-square. Um, so asking us to sort of um, move away from egoic beliefs or the need to judge um, or always be right and sort of um, also realize the truth is, is to an extent relative. So um, just in all senses trying to um, move away from you know egoic thought patterns and beliefs and um, also expand the mind and the mental body and consciousness so that it's it's more um, it's working with us rather than against us if you like so we're not self-sabotaging you know through the, through the, the sort of the monkey mind now in terms of Sauros series this is quite an interesting one so Bernadette Brady um, calls this one the five new south series and she associates it with very joyful, happy events. So it's a very happy family of eclipses, which I think fits with, with Sagittarius season. You know, we, uh, the sun ingressed into Sagittarius on around about the 22nd of November. So just after that uh, lunar eclipse that we had in Taurus. And it's, uh, Mercury followed suit a few days later. So this is very kind of upbeat, um, positive, optimistic, expansive, adventurous energy. So very different to Scorpio season. And it's all about good news, falling in love, and peak experiences. Now, of course, this could also um, potentially be good news for, for Bitcoin, as I mentioned in my last forecast. Um, but I will get into that in a separate um, uh, forecast, uh, you know, a kind of a six-month outlook, um, you know, closer to the time. I'll do that in a, in a separate um, video. Now, what's so interesting about this is that, as I said, the luminaries are going to make their conjunction near to the south node. So although we are starting this, this new six-month cycle, we may also be closing out an 18 to 19-year sour cycle, um, which, as I said, I, I feel is associated with comic release. So you, you might want to concentrate your mind back to around about 2003, November 2003, when we last had an eclipse in the series, in the Van der Berg series in particular, because there are two different sets of... Um, uh, 
the different ways of classifying the, the Saros families is the Vandenberg cycles, which map both lunar and solar eclipse families, and then there is the, the Brady um, Saros families, which which focus only on solar eclipses and um, are obviously more astrology based. But um, yes, you may well you know find yourself over the next six months or so, particularly over the first three months of this um, of this eclipse um, kind of uh, arc, if you like. Um, closing out sort of long-standing patterns or anything that was kind of bugging you or that maybe you, you didn't really understand or fully um, kind of assess what the spiritual lesson was, um, events from around about 2003. Um, but generally speaking, there are going to be historic links to um, eclipses in this series, so previous dates, um, which were 1967, 1985, 2003, and of course, you know, now kind of 2021. So, worth kind of casting your mind back, as I say, particularly to um, 2003 to see whether there are any ties, thematic ties, um, between now and then. But and as I was saying, with this emphasis on the South Node, it's interesting that the solar eclipse occurs at um, an interesting saving symbol called a widow's past brought to light and this is all about history so it's about I feel it's about rewriting past history and about being freeing ourselves from past baggage so this this as I say being able to stand in in the kind of stream of time as the um, you know as the Chinese would say this is kind of like the the way the Tao or the way and it's often seen as a stream or a channel um, and being able to sort of sort of pivot and turn around and sort of reimagine or revision the past so that we positively, we positively affect both the present and the future kind of going forward. So um, I think a real opportunity to revision our attitudes and beliefs, to see maybe past relationships in a new light, if we think of this in, in relation to the lunar eclipse, which is a lot about kind of relationships. Um, and also, you know, just being freed of, of any past baggage. So if the, the, the shadow of like a past relationship is continuing to cast... Um, sort of doubts or affect the way that you are in relationships now you know perhaps due to sort of past hurts or um, a difficult ending or something tragic happening you know really kind of um, letting, letting that go now and maybe understanding too why relationships failed in the past you know instead of assigning blame or kind of feeling like one party has to be the bad person and the other person you know gets to be sort of like the the, the sort of the victim or the hero if you like seeing the the kind of strengths and weaknesses in both people and being able to kind of forgive and just see things in a much more neutral um, kind of light if you like so yes I think also deciding to let go of old stories particularly if there are tragic stories again a link here to the Taurus lunar eclipse and also just clearing out any dead end feelings that might be kind of hanging around you know things that are being kind of rehashed over and over whether it's in the family um, or whether it's it's um, you know some kind of guilt that we carry about what we did in the past so somehow kind of making amends whether it's through kind of a ritual whether it's actually writing somebody a letter and and then burning it or sending it if we you know if we, if we feel that that would help but somehow just sort of letting go um of our any history that that is baggage and also reassigning meaning as i say seeing the lesson because as soon as we assign meaning or listen to something somehow um it's less painful it's it seems less um, like why did this happen to me um, and and then we can kind of move forward um, thinking okay well that was a bit of a shit show but you know and I've now learned like <laughs> that's not really the way forward I'm going to do things differently you know kind of from now on in sort of thing so in in that sense there's always something to be learned um, and something to be gained from even from difficult difficult past experiences but in terms of, of overall themes, we are dealing with um, mutable fire, and for me, Sagittarius is so strongly linked to this idea of enthusiasm or enthusiasmos, as the Greeks would call it. So, for them, th it's really interesting because um, they wouldn't just see it as being sort of like a positive feeling or kind of the this, this sense of being elevated or feeling very um, positive and optimistic. They they actually sort of being possessed by a god. So um, for them it was like being taken by a higher power, usually personified by a god, so being possessed by a god, and this fits in with the, the ancient idea of theurgy, um, which linked quite strongly to magical rituals and um, 
uh, kind of priestly rituals in which statues would be created that would then be considered suitable receptacles for the gods to inhabit in a temple, say for example. So that this idea of um, you know Greek statues um, being absolute images of perfection, um, so so that that they were considered suitable like houses or kind of uh, habit, habitable sp spaces for, for a god, you know, something divine, a divine being. Um, and it, it's so interesting too because, you know, enthusiasmos in this sense can also be about yourself, your body or your kind of, your, you know, being fooled by um, a god yourself, so being taken over by in, and sort of like by an ecstatic state, for example, and that this leads to a sort of a um, a shift in consciousness that allows one to achieve higher states of um, understanding and of knowing. Um, so you know, it also is associated, as I say, with um, with with ecstasy, and and this is almost being outside of oneself, where you are, you can be, you can have an out of body experience, or as I say, you your ordinary sense of consciousness moves aside, so that you can be elevated to higher states of mind, and um, and also to you know to kind of um, make contact with the gods if you like so um, some very interesting ideas that, that we're going to explore a little bit further now in terms of quadruplicity this is mutable energy so it's about movement change adaptability and plasticity so essentially um, it's quite useful when you've got this, this kind of plastic um, fire energy because fire is the element of spirit and it allows us to be more mutable and um, uh, adaptable so that we can actually move from one state to another and there's a lot in this um, this particular clips as I say about liminality so um, I think it fits quite nicely with that but overall it's a very optimistic upbeat energy it's very inspiring and joyful but there's also a lot of Pluto um, transits in here so I think it will also be quite passionate and you know we shouldn't forget that Sagittarius is considered to be a centaur that's almost kind of backing in nature you know um, Sagittarius can uh, lean to excess and you know the centaurs were considered to be quite earthy they were sort of half man half beast so there's also this element of sort of festivals and um, uh, kind of um, celebrations which are you know uh, as we kind of move into 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 the, the sort of the festive season I think that spirit tends to kind of take hold anyway so I think it's going to be quite a, a sort of an upbeat time which will make quite a shift to the the sort of quite dark energy that we had during October and November you know with Scorpio season so I think it will be a very welcome change um, and shift in energy now in terms of degree this um, eclipse occurs at 12 minutes and 22 seconds of Sagittarius which I think is quite interesting because it gives us 222 which is an angel number Number. and this is a number associated with hopeful messages divine revelations love peace balance and clarity so um, many see it as a confirmation that a wish is coming true or if things aren't quite kind of panning out going smoothly and need to shift one's mindset or attitude in order to kind of manifest something so I think this fits in very nicely with what I was saying about the the Sagittarius Gemini polarity with the with the nodes and also um, with that Jupiter T square that we had at the last eclipse which was asking us to sort of shift our attitude or mindset away from a kind of prideful need to be right or to judge others to see you know this party is good and this party is evil into a much more kind of forgiving and philosophical uh, and tolerant um, kind of, of space where um, you know we can see that there's sort of room for everyone and we can allow for more plasticity and pl plurality um, you know and, and sort of less be less defensive of, of our own position you know um, so key planets as I said we do have a Sun Mercury uh, moon conjunction in Sag so I think it's going to continue that notion of revelation insights and aha moments from the the lunar eclipse that we had but with a kind of an optimistic and an enthusiastic bent because of all this lovely Sagittarius energy because you know we now have the, the Sun Moon and Mercury in Sagittarius and but then on top of that we do still have that this overlay of Pluto energy but it's quite positive Pluto energy so Mars and Pluto will be making a sextile within a couple of days of this eclipse and I think this these are kind of the two powerhouses associated with um, with the sign of Scorpio, which is quite interesting, as I say, given that the last eclipse was in the, the Taurus Scorpio polarity. So um, this is about the combination of will and kind of control, passion and desire. And I think in that sense, taking those themes that we had last time around Eros, you know, we had the last two um, eclipses were focused on, on the, the positive and negative aspects of Mars, which is, of course, the original ruler of, of Scorpio. And then it, the following um, 
uh, full moon uh, lunar eclipse we had an emphasis on the kind of Taurus Scorpio axis so in other words almost um, the Venus Pluto or the Venus Mars sort of axis and of course we did have a Venus Mars kind of sextile um, so I think it, it's, it's, it's really sort of balancing the, the ideas of masculine and feminine sexual energy so um, you know that kind of Eros um, sort of um, Venus type of, of, of polarity um, but also this idea of will and control so um, kind of mastering the, the, the will, mastering the sexual desires, mastering passion and that kind of thing um, so that it, it doesn't kind of get the better of us or we don't sort of tip into like excess and then interestingly enough Venus will be conjunct Pluto so as I say it's, it's essentially a Venus Pluto sextile to Mars and this is really indicating again an extension of the themes of um, the uh, the lunar eclipse this is about deep intense passionate love that, that is transformative and healing and you know as I say if we think about that Venus Mars um, sextile which was in orb uh, from the 7th of November and it will be continue, continue to be in orbit until around about the 8th of December um, you know I do think that this is about um, a much more dynamic and easy energy happening between the, the, the sort of masculine, the divine masculine, divine feminine and between the, as I say, the masculine and feminine expressions of Eros and creativity. So this is about sexuality, creativity, um, it's also about money and will, uh, desire and passion um, and, you know, I think given that Venus is going to be going retrograde from around about the 19th of, of December it's almost as though the seam is going to kind of hang around much like the eclipse for a lot longer than um, than usual so Venus will also start kind of going retrograde on the 19th of December so this Venus Mars sextile never um, it doesn't make an exact um, kind of it doesn't reach exactitude this year it will only kind of um, you know uh, come into play next year um, when Venus sort of returns to forward motion um, so I think this gives us an opportunity to really kind of explore um, the sort of, um, you know, men are, men are from Mars, women are from Venus uh, kind of dynamic. Um, and, and, you know, this also applies to us internally with the kind of the anima and the animus. And um, to find ways to, to as I say, um, to kind of come together in a way that... Um, that allows for the, the sort of the yin and the yang expression of um, sexuality and desire because those were two huge themes as I say um, in both October and um, and November with, with, with the lunar cycle so um, yeah and then also if we think that Venus is in the sign of Capricorn along with Pluto I think that what this is talking about is a kind of an honest like focusing on honest artistic expression, truthful confessions, deep rooted structural shifts and changes to the status quo. You know, th this is Pluto that has slowly been moving through Capricorn over the last like 12 years or so. And, um, you know, I think we tend to see it particularly in the, in the way that it's breaking down old structures in um, finance and banking and, and that kind of thing. So patriarchy, uh, the, um, you know, the sort of the, the convention but I think, you know, we, we can also see it with Venus here. I think we can see it in, in um, a bit more of a personal light in terms of our attitudes and what we value in relation to sort of money, sex and creativity as well as beauty. Because, of course, Venus is also the ruler of kind of beauty and um, artistic expression. So deeper expressions of beauty that have a kind of deeper resonance and that also, you know, um, can be therapeutic. I think that that's also another way to look at, you know, artist therapy that type of thing. So as I was saying, you know, one of the, one of the themes for me around this um, particular solar eclipse is enthusiasm, this idea of um, kind of um, ecstasy or kind of inspired prophecy. And this was something that was very big in the Greek world, you know. Um, they had these oracles, the most famous being the one at Delphi, and here the Pythian pr priestess would actually sit on a kind of a tripod stool over like a, a chasm in the earth and the gases, natural gases from the earth would kind of come up and um, she would inhale them and she would be possessed um, by these kind of earth spirits if you like uh, and go into a trance. So uh, Strabo tells us in his geography that the Pythian priestess receives the breath 
so you know seeing this kind of this gas this uh cloud as breath and then access oracles in both verse and prose though the latter um, are put into verse by poets who are in the service of the temple. And I think what's so interesting is that this is a, this uh, idea of prophecy is actually a twofold process, which I think fits quite nicely with the idea of the, the Sagittarius Gemini polarity. So in essence, this Pythia, who was named actually um, after um, the snake goddess, so she was the Python Sibyl or the prophetess of Delphi, and she was named after um, uh, the dragon or the snake that was supposedly killed by the god Apollo, who is the sun god, the god of um, prophecy in, in Greek, uh, the Greek sort of pantheon. Um, and it was associated with um, sort of the, the ancient telluric currents of the earth that then became incorporated into Greek culture, as I say, as the study of kind of pneuma or breath that the, uh, the Pythia would take into her body. So perhaps, you know, because the earth was considered to be feminine, um, you know, any kind of gases that were kind of coming up um, from the ground um, would be seen as feminine and so the, you, need, you needed a, a feminine vessel um, in, you know in order to in order to kind of hold these um, these uh, energies if you like uh, so she was a priestess of Apollo the sun god and as I say she would sit over this tripod shaped stool and over a crack in the earth and fall into a trance but then the interesting thing is that she these would be interpreted by a male priest known as a prophetess so this means this is Greek for he who speaks on behalf of someone else. So they would take um, petitioners' questions and then um, interpret them in relation to, you know, what what the uh, the Pythia kind of uttered. And sometimes these wouldn't make sense. You know, much like a medium, a spirit medium wouldn't doesn't always make sense when she, she's kind of channeling. Um, that it's a very feminine form of receiving. It's like that. Uh, as I say, that cup that I was talking about of, of the crown chakra of receiving this information that comes through in symbolic form and then needs to be interpreted. Um, so then, you, you you know, the prophetess could almost be seen as that third eye, that sword, which then needs to sort of like take this information and discern it in relation to the context of the question and in relation to human concepts, words, that kind of thing. So combining left and right brain almost um, in order to make sense of uh, what has kind of come into the vessel. So um, as I say, it's very interesting that um, that this tradition continued, um, you know, throughout uh, the kind of classical period, and um, and that it's so strongly associated with with you know the sign of Sagittarius in particular, you know, this idea of enthusiasm. So, lots to kind of think about, and I think, you know, for me, um, the whole kind of idea of mediumship and um, divine inspiration is such an interesting topic. It's you know, it's very controversial. There's a lot around kind of debunking, you know, kind of um, mediumship if you like and trying to sort of marry science and um religion but i think you know once you sort of get get into it from this perspective that you see that these are two different orders of knowledge one comes through the crown um and is it comes through in poetic or symbolic form and and is, is kind of more feminine it's, it's a kind of receptive energy that requires us that it allows us to um receive this information um that's scientific or kind of um, a methodical approach to uh, to trying to sort of dissect or prove um, you know where this, this information comes from or if it the, the sort of veracity of it is kind of a waste of time because th this is related more to the third eye to the kind of the left brain and it, it's of the order of uh, kind of Gemini type of consciousness so the mind as opposed to the, the kind of the higher mind of wisdom um, so it's actually a kind of a pointless exercise uh, in a lot of ways, I think, to try and like prove uh, something um, scientifically uh, that, that is of a different order of knowledge. So I think it's, it's just worth bearing that in mind so that we don't kind of get into this, um, this polarity because what it can do is it can make us doubt when we get information from our guides or from our intuition. Um, or we can lose faith because of our need for proof the kind of the conscious minds need need for proof and i think it's just balancing that kind of um as i said that sagittarius gemini energy with a leaning more towards the sagittarius because that's where the sun and the moon are going to be um yeah so just something to think about you know now in terms of where the solar eclipse falls um again um here's a quick sort of cheat sheet 
just look for the sign of your um, your ascendant, so your rising sign, and this will tell you the house or the life area where this eclipse is going to fall. And this is likely to be areas where you can, you know, as I say, uh, clear or rewrite old baggage from the past that relate to about 2003, but also where you can set intentions or work on um, starting new projects or endeavors uh, kind of going forward between now and the middle of 2022. So I'll leave you to pause the video and have a look at this in more uh, depth and um, I'm going to uh, continue with, with, with the chart analysis. Right, so let's look at the chart in a little bit more detail. So uh, in terms of this eclipse, we can see here that the Sun and the Moon are sitting um, in Sagittarius and they're sitting quite close to the ascendant of the chart. So that's because this, this eclipse happens um, at around about 8.43 um, kind of... Uh, well, about 7.43 in GMT, so early in the morning in UK time. Uh, and so that's why they are kind of close to the horizon. Um, and we can see that with them is the part of fortune, as well as the parts of commerce and faith, as well as Mercury. So quite a packed first house. And this, this is kind of interesting energy. Um, you know, first of all, the part of fortune, um, well, all the, all the Arabic parts were essentially much like the nodes, they were sort of mathematical points that were sort of hypothetical and, and they're based on mathematical ratios between the ascendant, which is considered, to, it's the line of the horizon in the chart, um, and then various planets. So in the case of the parts of commerce and faith, we are talking about um, uh, Mercury and um, its relationship to the ascendant and then to, I think, the I think it's the sun and the moon. So it's these different combinations of solar and lunar energy and then in relation to the horizon. Um, and this all points to some big shifts happening, I think, economically. Um, so I do think it's, it's going to be very positive for Bitcoin, and I'm going to get into that in more detail, as I say, in my Bitcoin forecast. Um, but I do think that we, we could get um, some good news coming in now or some shifts in perspective that will allow us to approach commerce in a different way. You know, uh, I think it's an interest, it's interesting to combine the idea of commerce and faith, you know, our kind of spiritual values and our sort of philosophical um, our ethics, our kind of philosophical out outlook on life and the way that we do business or the way that we handle money. And I think we're starting to see that, particularly, as I say, in the in the sort of the DeFi space, there's a desire to kind of marry these two things so that you, you end up with a, a form of finance that's a lot fairer, that's a lot more kind of ethical and um, is more in keeping with, you know, trying to empower people rather than to sort of disempower them or keep them in a position of slavery. So I think it'll be interesting to see what developments come up between now and, and say, May, June next year in relation to um, commerce and, um, you know, f and, and faith. Um, but it does look very optimistic, as I say, because we are talking about this very positive Jupiterian energy. So I think quite some, some quite exciting developments ahead uh, and new um, ventures, projects, um, initiatives, uh, companies potentially in the offing. So um, I think that that looks very, very positive. Um, and then, as I say, we've got Venus conjunct Pluto. So you can see down here Venus and, um, and Pluto. Um, and in between them is the part of organization. It's also known as the part of, ga of the gavel. So I think it, this is more about kind of karmic justice, if you like. Um, and again, I think this fits with the idea of like rewriting the past and letting go of, of past baggage or saying sorry or making amends or forgiving somebody, um, you know, particularly in romantic relationships where we feel some just hurt us or, you know, in creative partnerships where maybe there's been a falling out or indeed um, uh, something, you know, maybe you've had a kind of financial partnership that, that didn't really pan out in the past and... Uh, <laughs> you know, you ended up having a dispute of some kind over a contract or about money. I think also this can be kind of healed or rectified now. So um, I think that's that's worth bearing in mind, especially with Venus and Pluto in the second house, which is the house of, you know, value, skills and money um, and also self-worth. Um, and then the luminaries are going to be trying to Chiron, which I think, again, points to healing. Um, we can see Chiron down here in, in Aries, kind of retrograde. So I think healing conversations, if we consider this as the third house of self-expression and of, um, you know, uh, communication. So possibly you might hear from somebody now, um, or you might reach out to somebody that maybe you, you've had beef with, um, and finally settle an old dispute, or just sort of pave the way to um, 
you know, being friends or at the very least sort of being civil to each other and just letting bygones be bygones. So I think that's 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 very positive. Um, now the, the luminaries um, are going to be Queen Kunks to Uranus, and Uranus is still retrograde in Taurus, so we can see it here in the fifth house. So this calls for some, uh, like a potential some pen, potential adjustments where things in me maybe need, need to be. Um, tweaked a little bit in order for changes to really kind of take and again given that Uranus is transiting through Taurus this could well have to do with adjustments within the financial sector that would allow for reforms to come in that are going to be sort of beneficial long term and here I think we need to bear in mind that Uranus is applying to a square to Saturn um, so Saturn is here at nine degrees of, um, of, of Aquarius and you know they are going to be making the final pass of their transit um, in December, so around about the 24th of December. Um, so this will bring to an end or to a conclusion that very long set of transits we've had that have straddled 2021 from mid-February to mid kind of May, June, and then now in December. So a lot of things that I think there can be kind of wrapped up where we are trying to kind of find ways to marry the old and the new um, and um, to sort of also deal with change in a way that doesn't feel so scary you know Saturn doesn't like change uh, Uranus can sometimes be guilty of change for change's sake and I think it's 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 about kind of striking that balance um, uh, you know between th these two things and I think maybe that's why we've got the Kun Kunks to the luminaries you know just making adjustments in terms of attitude but also how we kind of communicate things how we see things how we how we um, negotiate things um, how we our, our, our just our general outlook and, 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 and sort of approach to beliefs and that, that can be very helpful in, in helping us to adjust to change which you know can feel scary especially you know in, uh, in current times where things have been so volatile and so kind of um, uncertain and then um, finally um, Neptune is going direct it'll, it'll go direct on the 1st of December so a couple of days before this um, this solar eclipse and I think that's going to be a huge relief to a lot of people. You know, Neptune, when it's retrograde, tends to really cause a lot of um, kind of muddled thinking, cloudiness, doubt. It, fears tend to kind of creep in these, these sort of nebulous fears where we, we, we just have these kind of niggly um, apprehensions about the future and very often not founded in anything other than a sort of, a, as I said, this, this kind of nebulous feeling in the back of our minds. And it can really play on our ability to, to make decisions and to move forward and to actually have faith that things are going to work out for the better. So I think it's it's um, it's very fortunate that Neptune is turning direct now because I think it will help us to tune into this very positive energy that's coming in now, um, you know, in relation to Sagittarius season and and the solar eclipse. So I think um, this eclipse in many ways giving us the all clear to really sort of put down doubts and fears, let go of the past and really look to the future with kind of optimism and hope. And now in terms of fixed star aspects, um, it's interesting, I mean Antares is going to be rising with the luminaries, so we can see the Sun and the Moon, you know, here in uh, the sign of Scorpio and this is the, um, this is because we're talking about the sidereal zodiac, so um, it's always one sign behind because of the precession of the equinoxes, so the Sun and the Moon essentially making a um, uh, like a loose conjunction with Antares, which is the uh, the heart of the Scorpion, uh, and this is part of the constellation of Scorpio, and it's the star that represents um, success or passion, which is very sort of can be a bit tunnel vision, but it can also be very dedicated sort of to a, like one particular cause. So um, Antares in uh, kind of ancient times was one of the world stars of Persia, so it was known as the Watcher of the West, and as such is associated with the Archangel Gabriel, the Angel of of the Grail, the emotions. Um, the emotional body and of humanity, which fits so well with with a lot of the um, the sort of the key themes in this um, in this particular eclipse. If we think about the fact that Jupiter and Saturn are both in the sign of Aquarius, that we have this emphasis on the Grail, on the cup. You know, Sagittarius as being that uh, receptive energy I was talking about of allowing in um, enthusiasm, you know, allowing in inspiration, divine inspiration, and um, intuitive hits. Um, and also this idea of humanity being tied to the sign of Aquarius, which is also the water bearer, you know. Um, plus this need to balance the emotional body with the um, the mental body. And I have actually put up um, a very nice transmission by Steve Novell, uh, which is all which is designed to help us balance out 
the the emotional and mental bodies and also um his previous one which was i think focused on mercury and the caduceus so the archangel raphael the the angel of the, the sort of magician angel um which was focused on sort of rewriting the past and actually going back and healing past timelines so the two i think together um work quite well to um to help us work actively with the the main the main themes and energies of this this particular eclipse um but then you know i think what's also interesting about um this this particular um uh, constellation is that the Egyptians associated it with Osiris who you know like the Greek is Dionysus was a fertility god and that was a huge theme at the the Taurus lunar eclipse you know this idea of of being fertile and of being green and also allowing yourself to be abundant in the sense of sharing so allowing yourself to be eaten and um, you know and that, that and it's also in turn associated with transitions and liminal space so um, I think very interesting kind of overlaps here um all these themes kind of coming together um and then if we think about uh, the, the tarot you know um scorpio is associated with with the, the death card and of course pluto with judgment and, and pluto is the modern day ruler of scorpio so in that sense with those scorpio transits i think we we being given a chance to um to be reborn you know death and resurrection you know death was very much scorpio season now we are um, moving into that more kind of resurrection energy with the, the new moon solar eclipse so endings followed by revivals the sense of healing of rewriting of rebirth of reinvention all of those kind of things so i think when we combine it with with the luminaries um it's really giving us a theme around personal like vision passion intensity uh, sometimes emotional drama and power struggles but i think also moving beyond those learning to sort of move beyond those and move into a, um, a space of more kind of courage, self-honesty, and a willingness to face up to our challenges and see like confrontation in a different light. Where it's less about fighting with with other people and, as I say, c perpetuating drama, and more about cooperation. So working, finding ways to work with other people rather than against them, or having to see everything in terms of like win lose. You know, rather sort of seeing things in terms of like win win. And then if we think of that Venus-Mars-Pluto combination, uh, which, you know, is very strongly associated with Antares, um, it could also be about major life decisions, changes, life changes, changes in romantic status, highly charged romantic relationships that are also transformative and psychological thresholds and pivot points. So personal breakthroughs, I think, are also possible here, given that the, um, the luminaries are so much about, um, like, heart versus head, so internal kind of consciousness. But, you know, then also, if we think in terms of um, the Hermetic tradition and sect, it's also about the father and the mother. So, you know, those those are the son being the father and, and the moon being the mother. And also what we, what we inherit from both parents. We think about attachment style, for example. Um, but also um, sort of spirit versus materialism, you know, um, Fortuna in a way that... Uh, the moon is strongly associated with fortuna and the, the sort of the changing fortunes of life here on earth so kind of also earthly riches uh, on the one hand and then the part of spirit is more associated with our soul on the other hand and with kind of divine wisdom and divine knowing and those of course are um tied up in the, in the parts of fortune and spirit and you know given that the that the the emphasis here is on the south node and on the part of fortune uh, you know this the luminaries will be close to the part of fortune i think it's really talking about changes in that are changing sort of belief or attitude or um, consciousness will also lead to a change in personal fortune and our relationship with, with abundance and personal security and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think there's this, this an interesting inversion almost happening um, at this eclipse where um, even though it's in, in the sign of Sagittarius, there's a, there's a lot here about transforming the material world you know being like the magician who's able to kind of transform our personal circumstances particularly uh, creatively financially and romantically um, for the better so that's kind of it for this forecast as i say if you are interested in more in-depth personalized eclipse horoscopes i am going to be doing them for all the 12 signs on my website um, but it's, it's members only so um, you can subscribe to access by going to my astrology shop um, i will put the details below in the description box for those of you who are interested 
Um, but for those of you who are leaving me now with this free forecast, I, I'm wishing you all the very best for the festive season and for the coming new year. And um, I'll catch you again for my final forecast for 2021, which will be the full moon um, that's happening on December the 19th, so at the solstice.